This is a recording of Tentacles chapters 34 through 37. Chapter 34, Chaos. Luther had no problem finding Bo because Bo found him. She was pounding on the outer moon pool door and Luther didn't like the way she looked. He showed the gizmo to Wolf. What's gotten into her? Wolf asked. She looks crazed, but don't worry. Your hair is safe. The door is blast proof. Yeah, Luther said, but is it bow proof? Bo had given up pounding on the doors with her hands and was now taking running starts and hitting the doors with both feet. As they watched, they heard an odd sound, as if a turbine was powering off. The lights went out, replaced a second later by dim emergency lights. What the? Wolf started hitting buttons on the control panel to no effect. You hear that? He asked. I don't hear anything, Luther said. Exactly, Wolf said. The power is down throughout the ship. He keyed his radio. Cap? Yep, we're dead, Cap said. I just talked to the engine room crew. They said they heard a series of small popping sounds. Then everything went off. Our ship to shore radio is out too. And our satellite radios have been jammed. Our secure radios work, obviously. And so did the crews two ways. But there's so much chatter, you can't get a word in edgewise. I've tried to get them to calm down and shut up, but they aren't listening. How about the ship's PA system, Wolf asked. Dead. Butch, Wolf said. No doubt, Cap replied. Small explosive, perfectly placed. Professional job. It will take hours, if not days, to get the power back on. He blew the engines, too. We're up a creek without a paddle. I have some guy searching for other explosives just in case he has something bigger in mind. Good idea, Wolf said. If they find anything, get a hold of Al or Joe. They'll be able to defuse them. How long will the exhilarating, the exhilarating power last? Hopefully, long enough for us to get the power back up. And the only thing the batteries will run are the lights. How about the moon pool doors? Can we close them when we need to? Maybe. But they use a lot of juice. If you try it, probably drain the batteries dry, and it'll pitch, it'll be pitch dark below deck. Can you get a hold of Ted? He might be able to come up with some way to work around this. Wolf looked at the blank monitors. Ted's not available. He's on his own. I mean, we are on our own. Cap had never met Ted Bronson and didn't know he was a board disguised as Theo Sonborn. Al broke into conversation. We're suspending the search for Roy, he said. The lights are probably just a prelude to something much worse. I'm sending an available hands topside to set up our defenses. Good, Wolf said. I'm going to have to stick down here for a while and try to get in touch with our friends. No problem. We'll have it covered up here. Al signed off. During this exchange, Bo had given up on the moon pool doors and was scampering down the companionway on all fours looking for her next victim. Luther followed her with the dragon spy, while Wolf tried to figure out a way to get at least the radio communication back online with the orb. It was harder to fly the dragon spy in the dim emergency light, and it wasn't helpful that the ship was now in chaos. Crew members were running in all different directions, and confused scientists were emerging from their labs, asking why they had lost power. Some of the answers Luther overheard were, we're under attack, there was an explosion, hide, the chimp has rabies. Wolf was right about Bo's behavior. When she'd been trying to yank out Luther's hair, she looked like she was enjoying herself. It was a game, but there was no joy now, and this was no game. She was enraged, banging on the doors. She passed and slapping aside anyone standing in her way. It looked as if she had lost her mind. Bo ran into the dark corridor, and Luther had to slow the dragon spy so he didn't smash it into a wall. When he reached the next turn, Bo was gone. What do we do? Grace asked in the dimly lit lab. Bertha was out of the bunk with her shotgun in one hand and her radio in the the other, monitoring the situation. We stay right here, the formal general answered. Butch, or whoever blew out the power, is trying to create chaos, and by the sound of the radio clatter, he's doing a pretty good job of it. Bo didn't get out of her cage on her own. Someone let her just let her out just as sure as someone cut the power. He's probably done some other things to maximize the pandemonium. When it peaks, he's going to show up here and try to grab you and the hatchlings. That might be a good reason for us not to be here when he shows up, Anna said. 
Bertha shook her head. He's close by. He knows where we are. He's waiting for us to open the door and come out. One sat up, which aroused two. They both yawned and started mewing. And it's feeding time again, Laurel added. Chapter 35, Predators. I don't like it, Ted said. Everything checks out here, which means the problems aboard the Kolenkov. There are three backup systems on the ship. The only way they can they could lose all of them is a complete power failure. Maybe we should... Their ears were assaulted by a nearly deafening, pinging noise, followed by a series of equally loud clicking sounds. What is that? Marty shouted, putting his hands on either side of his helmet. You don't have to shout, Ted said, but it wouldn't do you any good to cover your ears through your helmet. Just turn your speaker volume down. He pointed to the switch. Marty turned it down, but his ears were still ringing. So... What is it? He repeated. Sperm whales, Leopold answered. Five or six of them, all females, if I'm not mistaken. How do you know? Marty asked. I'm fluent in sperm whale, Leopold said. Did you mean sperm whale as in Moby Dick, the 60-foot behemoth? The kind of whale that swallowed Jonah in the Bible? The largest tooth whale in the ocean? Marty asked. The same, Leopold said calmly. And I can't tell you how delighted I am to hear that you have so much knowledge of this wonderful predator. Marty wished he didn't know so much about them. Think they're interested in gulping down an orb? That's an excellent question, Leopold said. By the sound of their echolation, they are definitely hunting, but I don't know how they would respond to our little ball. Don't worry about it, Ted said. If they come after us, we'll be able to outmaneuver them. Oh, and I should warn you both. If we have to do that, you might get a little queasy. Try not to vomit in your helmet. It won't hurt any of the electronics aside, but it will be kind of unpleasant. Marty was happy he hadn't eaten breakfast before they left. I wouldn't be so sure about your ability to outmaneuver them, Leopold said. They are excellent group hunters but not going to give them a chance to try, Ted said. We're going back up to see what's going on aboard the Kolenkov. I think that would be a mistake, Dr. Bronson, Leopold said. Call me Ted. And why would that be a mistake? We should get closer to the whales, Leopold answered. They're among the most intelligent predators on Earth. They would not have expended the energy to get into the depth without a high expectation of finding food. If they are here, they are squid nearby. In fact, one of the accolations was a sound I haven't heard before, and I'm very familiar with their lexicon. The unusual sound may have been emitted to actually bring a giant squid out of its lair. I'm speculating, of course. We know virtually nothing about giant squid and sperm whale interaction, but this may be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to learn something about their predator-prey interaction and share it with the scientific community. Not without a way of communicating that information, Marty thought, and not if the orb becomes the prey and gets crunched into, in their powerful jaws. We're going back up, Ted said, to Marty's relief. If everything is okay, we'll come back down. But the whales may not still be here, Leopold persisted. They're, they're doing our work for us. Without them, we could search the canyon for months without seeing a single giant squid. The whales are our beacons. After they get their fill, they'll move on. Ted didn't say anything for a long time, which Marty took as a bad sign. Leopold's argument made sense, but it was clear that Ted had a bad feeling about what was going on aboard the Kolenkov. Noah Blackwood and Butch McCall were not in the area of pleasure cruise, as Butch had already proven. 30 minutes, Ted said. 45 tops, then we go up. Excellent decision, Leopold said. Terrible decision, Marty thought. Ted turned the orb in the direction for the hunting whales. The predator aboard the Kolenkov could not be more pleased about how his prey were responding. They were running back and forth along the corridors like blind cats. His old pit bull, Dirk, would have loved this. Wolf had changed the code on the secure radios, but it didn't matter anymore. Butch had switched to Blackwood's frequency and had talked to him several times in the past hour. Everything and everyone was in place, waiting for Butch's word. He put Roy's radio in his clean-shaven face and said, Come up and get him. Copy, Blackwood responded. We're on our way. We'll give them a 15-minute head start. Then the fun will begin. Butch clipped the radio to his belt and stuck 
the ear piece in his ear. He chambered around in his autom- in his automatic and stuck it behind his back in the waistband of his pants. He checked to make sure his green armband was securely in place and started to button his white lab coat, but thought better of it. He would need quick access to his gun and radio. He adjusted his wig and his eyeglasses. Dr. O'Connor going hunting. He started down the companionway toward lab nine. Dr. Wolf. Wolf was lying on his back under the control panel with a flashlight clamped in his teeth, trying to figure out a way to reroute what little power they had to the orb communication system when Yvonne's voice finally broke through on a two-way. With difficulty, he unclipped the little radio and brought it to his lips. Where have you been, Yvonne? I was in the infirmary with Dr. Jones playing chess. I didn't have my two-way on. He said it disturbed his concentration. As soon as the lights went on, I turned it back on, but there was so much chatter I couldn't get a hold. The insane chatter interrupted Yvonne's transmission. Wolf cursed and waited for a lure in the frantic exchanges, wishing he had given Yvonne an encrypted radio. The lull finally arrived, and he keyed the mic and held it down so no one could interrupt their transmission. Yvonne, switch to channel 18, he said. And if I hear anyone else using channel 18 in the next 10 minutes, I will personally keyhaul you. In fact, stay off the two ways unless you have something urgent to communicate. He switched to channel 18. Are you there, Yvonne? Yes, Yvonne said. What did you want me to do? Bo is loose. I heard, but there's something the matter with her. She's hurting people, which isn't like her. I think she's been drugged. Who would do something like that? Someone who wants to hurt us, Wolf said. He told her about Butch McCall. What does he look like? We don't know exactly, Wolf answered. He's a big guy, but he could be posing as a scientist. We need to stay clear of him. Don't worry, I will, Yvonne said. I need you to go up to the cabin on the bridge. There's a tranquilizer pistol under my bunk. Have you ever used one? Of course. Load a couple of darts with ketamine. The drugs are in the fridge under the lab bench. You need to find Bo and trank her ASAP. I know my son around with trying to coax or manipulate her into a cage. She's way beyond that. She's causing us more trouble than being dead in the water is. I want you to knock her out and drag her back into the cage. I'm on my way to your cabin right now, Yvonne said. Where is she? Hang on. Wolf scooted out from under the control panel and saw Luther staring down at the gizmo. I've been listening, Luther said, without looking up. I lost her. What? Wolf shouted. Hey, Luther said, the dragon's bite isn't easy to fly in the dark. Wolf took a deep breath and calmed himself. <sighs> Sorry, I know you're doing the best you can. Door du jour, Luther said. I find, I'll find her again, and I'll have to, all I have to do is follow her path of destruction. I'm in your cabin, Yvonne said over the two-way. Is Cap at the helm? Wolf asked. Yes. He tried to stop me from going into your cabin. I shouted him out of the way. Good. Give him your two-way while you load the darts. Cap here. There's a spare secure radio in my desk. Fire it up and give it to Yvonne. She's a member of the team now, and Evan... And everyone else monitoring this call should treat her as such. She has full access to everywhere and anything. Do you all copy? Al, Joe, and Bertha all acknowledge. Good. Now put Yvonne back on the two-way. Hang on, Cap said. She has her hands full loading darts. While Wolf waited, he watched Luther concentrating on the screen. Any luck? Not yet, Luther said. But I just spotted Congo and PD. The darts are loaded, Yvonne said. Where is she? Luther's tracking her. With the tags? No, Wolf said. The tags are offline, and she didn't have one on anyway. I didn't know that, Yvonne said. So how is he tracking her? I'll tell you later, Wolf said. We'll be able to stay in touch with Luther on the radio Cap gives you. Tell her to head down to the lab deck, Luther said. That's the direction Bo was heading when I lost her, and that's also where Congo and PD are going. Wolf filled Yvonne in, adding, you're officially my full-time animal behaviorist and trainer, Yvonne. That is, if you still want the job. Are you kidding? Yvonne said happily. It's a dream come true. I won't let you down. You never have. Thank you and good luck. Wolf looked at Luther, parked the dragon spice for a second. I need to configure your gizmo so you can talk on our radios. Luther landed the dragon spy on a ceiling pipe. Wolf punched in some numbers and spoke into the speaker. Can you hear me, Yvonne? Loud and clear. Good. I'm handing you back to Luther. Chapter 36. 20 minutes. Leopold was wrong. There were eight whales. 
and to Marty's relief, they were only mildly interested in the orb, which looked like a salmon egg next to the gigantic gray barnacle encrusted bodies. Do you see the squid suction marks on that one? Leopold was practically jumping out of his seat. The marks were hard to miss. The whale was only inches away from the orb, and the marks were as big as a garbage can lids. By the size of the scars, I say the squid was at least 30 feet long, Leopold said. The whales circled the orb for about three minutes, decided it was appetizing, and assumed their journey through the canyon in search of something more to their taste than giant calamari. Or are squid blind? Marty asked. On the contrary, Leopold said. Their eyes are the largest of any animal on Earth. The size is thought to be an adaption to the dark realm in which they live. The large surface of their receptors gather what little light there is. Essentially, they can see in the dark. Then they must not be very smart, Marty said. The whales are not exactly using stealth to hunt them. Why would a squid come out of hiding to take on something the size of a house with teeth? No one knows, Leopold said. My guess is that the whale doesn't always win. Squid have an advantage over a whale. They don't need the surface to breathe. If a squid got its arms and tentacles around a whale in the right way, it might be able to hold the whale under until it drowns. A sperm whale can stay under water for an hour and a half. We don't know how long this pod has been down here, but let's say that they've been in the canyon for an hour. A squid would only have to keep one of them from surfacing for 30 minutes. And that isn't taking into consideration the aero, the aerobotic energy the whale would have to expend battling the squid. The whales are certainly hunting Archimedes, but Archimedes might also be hunting the whales. We know nothing about Archimedes' hunt. They might hunt in packs. Three or four giant squid could easily overwhelm a single whale. It wouldn't stand a chance. A whale carcass could feed a pack of giant squid for days. Not only would they be able to feed off the carcass, but the carcass would attract fresh food for the squid to eat. Clearly, the battle is worth the risk for both species. We might not find out how they hunt on this dive, Ted said. In 25 minutes, we're headed to the surface. This is a very deep canyon, Leopold said. Perhaps the walls are blocking the colon calls transmissions. Not a chance, Ted said. We're not using a radio signal you'd be familiar with, and I can tell you how it works for proprietary reasons. Fair enough, Leopold said, but perhaps you could tell me how you plan to keep the squid alive if you're lucky enough to get it aboard the colon cough. I've asked Dr. Wolf several times, and he's refused to give me any details. I was brought aboard to help keep Archimedes alive. This dive alone has certainly been worth a trip, but I can't help you if I don't know what the plan is. Ted laughed. Actually, the reason you're here is because it's your plan, Dr. Leopold. We stole it from you. Three years ago, you published a paper on the pressure chamber you built for giant squid. Baby giant squid, Leopold corrected. Someday someone will catch a young squid. I built a chamber for that eventually. We kind of improved on the design and scale, Ted said. The moon pool is actually a giant pressure chamber a closed system where we can recreate almost in an atmospheric condition. We hope to get a squid inside the pool and match the conditions down here. On the way back to the States, we'll see if we can slowly acclimate the squid to a pressure more suitable for exhibition purposes. If that doesn't work, we have an identical chamber at the Northwest Aquarium. It won't work for exhibition, but we can keep Archimedes alive in it until we figure out what to do. And since it was your idea, you can write as many scientific papers on it as you like. Marvelous, Leopold said giddily. Absolutely marvelous. What about the dolphins, Marty asked. They'll be kept in the holding pool, which is outside the chamber. You thought of everything, Leopold said. Not everything, Ted said. I didn't think we'd lose communication with the Kolenkov. We have 20 minutes. Chapter 37. Pirate. What? Wolf shouted. He was still tinkering underneath the control panel while Luther continued to search for Bo. Pirates, Al repeated over the radio. A couple dozen of them. Nine speedboats that we
we've counted. Well-armed. They're shooting at Blackwood's yacht. Blackwood is returning fire, but not very effectively. His cooks and waiters must be terrible shots. Wolf scooted out from under the panel again and got to his feet. We have to help them, he said. Are you crazy? Al said. This is the best thing that ever happened to us. If we're lucky, they'll sink both the Blackwood ships. It's called Manifest Destiny, Wolf. Or tough luck. Knock it off, Al Wolf said. We can't let them sink his ships. This was followed by a long silence. Luther continued flying the dragon spy below deck, but he could imagine clearly the aspirated expression on Al Ike's face. Luther thought Wolf was nuts, too. I'm sure. I don't have to remind you, Al continued, but Noah Blackwood is the same guy who killed Roy who had Roy killed, attempted to kidnap your daughter and tried to have your nephew thrown overboard. He's done a lot more than that over the years, Wolf said, and I'm still not willing to let him go down like that. Okay, Al said. How about if we let the pirates have their way with him for a while? Let them mess up his ships like he's messed up ours. Level the playing field a bit. No, Wolf said. For crying out loud, Al shouted. A few weeks ago, you stranded him in the middle of the Congo to die. Wolf shook his head. I knew Noah wouldn't die. Butch was with him, and Butch McCall could make his way out of the jungle, shackled and blindfolded. Hang on a second, Al said. Four of the boats have broken off of the attack and are headed this way. I'm coming up, Wolf said, looking at Luther. Let's go. What about Bo? Luther asked. Park the bot. Maybe we'll get lucky and she'll run by. Right now, we'll have bigger problems than a berserk chimpanzee. Luther landed the dragon spy on the ledge of the lab deck just above one of the emergency lights. The little bot's batteries were getting low and could use the time to recharge. Wolf got Yvonne on the radio as they made their way to the upper deck. Yvonne, did you catch Al's transmission? Yes. Luther's with me. You're on your own. Don't worry, I'll get her, Yvonne said. I think I know where she is. Noah Blackwood was on the deck of Endangered One with cameras rolling, enjoying himself immensely. When he was a kid, he loved Buccaneer movies, couldn't get enough of them, and now he was right in the middle of one. The star, as a matter of fact. Rifle blazing, his face grim and determined as he repelled the horde of filthy cutthroats. The right sleeve of his khaki shirt was torn at the shoulder, where a bullet had grazed him. Bright red blood dripped onto the deck from the terrible wound. He ignored the pain, which was easy because there was no pain. The rip in his sleeve had not been caused by a bullet, but by his personal makeup artist. The pirates firing at his beautiful ship were his own men firing blanks. The blood was his own blood. He never meant an anywhere without it. If he got into an accident that required a transfusion... He was not about to let his body be tainted with someone else's blood. He had enough of his own blood stored in a special refrigerator aboard the yacht to fill himself up twice over. He gave a signal. The pirates broke off their attack and headed toward Wolf's dilapidated freighter. Get the boats, Noah shouted. They're going after the colon cop. We'll have to stop them. He bounded over the rail as if he were jumping onto a black zodiac and landed on a king-sized mattress. He looked up at his cinematographer. How'd that look? Beautiful, the cinematographer replied. All we need now are a few tight shots of you in the zodiac, firing your rifle, shouting orders, and we'll have a wrap. Noah stood. Let's get it over with then. I have an appointment in a few minutes, and I don't want to be late. The footage would be carefully edited and played on television for the next decade. Noah smiled at the thought. Reality TV at its best. Luther and Wolf tried on, arrived on deck out of breath. They're all heading this way now, Al said. Broke off the attack on Blackwood completely. The three-piece suit was gone. Al was dressed in full camouflage battle fatigues with a flask black vest, helmet, and enough weapons strapped to his body to make to take on nine boats of pirates single-handedly. There were at least a dozen crew members on deck, also in flak vests, manning the strangest weapons that Luther had ever seen. 
There were three bolted on the deck on the port side, three on the starboard, and one on the stern and bow. Each weapon had what looked like a small satellite dish on the front and a swivel seat protected by seal pl plating on the back. Men were strapped into the seats, looking through scopes, pivoting the units, and getting used to the controls. Joe and Phil were running from one unit to another, shouting instructions on how to operate them. What the heck are those? Luther asked. Sonic Canyons, Al said. With pinpoint laser sights, we can blow up a pirate's brain from the inside out if we wanted to. He looked at Wolf. But I don't suppose Dr. Pacifist here is going to let us do that. Very astute, Al, Wolf said, mildly irritated. We'll start by blowing out their eardrums and just scramble their brains a little. If that doesn't work, we'll tone up the heat. Fair enough, Al said. Are these one of Ted's inventions? Luther asked. No, Al answered. They're military, but Ted has fiddled them with a little bit to make them more accurate. He just can't keep his hands off things. Can I try one? Luther asked. No, Wolf and Al said in unison. Do you have any spare flak vests? Wolf asked Al. There's a pile of them over there, he pointed. Put one on, Wolf said. Wolf told Luther. Then going up to the bridge and stay there and stay away from the windows. Disappointed but not surprised, Luther put on the vest and, prom and tromped up to the bridge, which was abandoned. He peeked out the window, saw Wolf staring up at him, and ducked down quickly. Then he remembered that there was more than one way to see outside. He took out the gizmo.